Welcome back to my Vivarium Paladarium build. We're continuing where we left off last time and we basically spray foamed uh, the background and the side wall into place. And now it's time to start carving the background so it actually looks like a rocky structure later. You can use different tools for this job. Here you see me using some razor cutting tools, which you can find online for less than $10. This was a set and it came with a long razor tool that you can see me hold right now. And then there's a shorter one. Uh, however, the shorter one did not work for me at all. Not that the blades were dull, but I just couldn't find a good grip on the foam and it just wouldn't cut. The longer one worked a little bit better, but still kind of slow and it was a little bit awkward going around uh, curves and turns. So I honestly can't recommend these tools too much, but I know there are other um, builders out there that love these tools. And so I would suggest if you have them or if you can find them for cheap, maybe give them a try. Instead of these razor blade cutting tools, I actually recommend a small kitchen knife. First of all, you should already have one of these and you don't have to spend extra money on it. And as you can see, it cuts a lot easier through this foam. Just make sure that the knife is sharpened before you use it because a dull knife is not going to cut it, literally. And uh, yeah, and then with one sharp knife, you can pretty much carve the entire backdrop. I did not have to go back and resharpen the knife, although it probably can't hurt either. Um, and I'm just going to eliminate a lot of these, you know, shiny parts of the spray foam. And the reason why we do this is because later we will use uh, silicone and dry lock to basically paint this and give this more structure. And the shiny pieces of the spray foam uh, will not hold the glue or the dry lock paint too well. So basically the goal of this is not only to shape it so it looks more natural and more like a rock, but also to remove all the shiny pieces of the spray foam. And if you look closely, you will actually see that there are little holes in there uh, that are still filled with some shiny parts. And that is okay because you, there's gonna be so many tiny little holes and it's not expected of you to go and eliminate all of these holes and cut it out. And honestly, that wouldn't look that natural either. So the way I do this generally is I'm going to give this a rough cut first, essentially removing all the shiny pieces. And then once I have done that, I will go back into it and I will give this some more structure. So like I said, I, you don't want to have a lot of long, flat pieces or surfaces just because it looks unnatural. So just uh, cut a little bit deeper, cut a little bit shorter, uh, give it some curves and twists and just make it look natural. And uh, I'm going to speed this process up so at the end you will see the finished results after we're done cutting everything. And here you can see the finished result. I am done carving the spray foam into rock looking shapes. And now I'm going to use a marker and I'm marking on the backdrop where I want some natural looking crevices to run along because no rock wall is just flat. It just wouldn't look natural. So I'm marking these crevices and then I'm going to use the hot wire tool that you have seen me use in part one of this video. And I'm basically just following the lines that I'm drawing here to uh, create some realistic looking crevices. And then I'm also going to use the hot wire tool to basically give everything in between some shape too. And let me just finish marking everything and then I'll show you how this process looks like. 
All right, and now that we have drawn all the crevices on the backdrop, you can use the hot wire tool. And we're just following along these lines and we're just creating some crevices, as I mentioned. And you can basically go as deep as you want here, although I recommend not going deeper than half the depth of your styrofoam. So in my case, the styrofoam backdrop is one inch thick. So I'm trying to make no crevice deeper than about half an inch because I want to avoid breaking through on the other side. That being said, if that happened, it wouldn't be the end of the world because with the dry lock, you could definitely fill the crevice again. And uh, yeah, it's not the end of the world, but you know, you can avoid this very easily. So try and do your best to do so. Uh, but make it so that some of the crevices are deeper than others. And that gives it a really natural looking um, yeah, aspect. And yeah, th this will take some time uh, because after you're done with the crevices, you also have to give all the spaces in between a more naturalistic, um, I guess, structure because nothing in nature is this flat. It just wouldn't look natural. So like I said, this will take some time. This is probably one of the most tedious processes uh, when building a backdrop for your terrarium, vivarium, paludarium, uh, really anything. Uh, but take your time with this because the end result will look so much better. And I just wanted to pause for a moment and now show you how I carve the rest of the backdrop after I'm done with the crevices. Uh, it's a little bit easier on the edges just because you can use this horizontal flat technique and basically carve uh, turns and ups and downs very easily. Uh, that's a little bit harder once you get to the middle part just because you can't hold your hot wire horizontally like you'd see me do here. Um, without actually destroying some of your previous work. Uh, so it will take a little bit more time once you get more towards the middle, but that's okay. Um, I would suggest taking that time uh, because the result will look really, really good. And uh, yeah, I just wanna emphasize one more time, and I've mentioned this in part one, but when you do this hot wiring on styrofoam, uh, try to do so in a very well ventilated area just because the fumes that come from this smell horrible and they can definitely not be healthy um, so try to do this maybe outside or in a room that you're not going to be in for a long time maybe have a, uh, a fan uh, blowing the fumes away from you uh, just because it really really stinks And here we are. This is how the backdrop looks after I'm done carving it. I'm pretty happy with the result, and I can go into the next steps now. So next up, we're going to use a regular heat gun, which you can find in pretty much any hardware store for about 20 bucks or so. And we're going to uh, run over the entire styrofoam backdrop. And the purpose of this is uh, melting the surface a little bit more while not really destroying the uh, work that we have done so far. But um, basically we're melting the surface a little bit and uh, therefore the styrofoam actually hardens and uh, yeah the surface just becomes that much more durable at the end so i do recommend this step however it is optional and if you do not want to spend the additional 20 dollars or you know you're not going to use this heat gun for any other projects in the future uh, you do not have to do this but like i said if you uh, if you can i would probably do it just because it gives it a little bit more durability um, and it also smooths out any rough edges that we might have left in the styrofoam. 
And now that we're done working on the background, we're going to start working on the sidewall. I just want to pause for one moment and uh, just quickly say that the way I'm doing my backdrop is not the only way you can create a naturalistic backdrop. You do not have to uh, get a styrofoam board and basically put some spray foam on it and then carve it. The only reason why I did it is because for me personally, I find it easier if I can work on the backdrop outside of the tank just because I can get into the nooks and crevices a lot easier uh, compared to when the spray foam is already in the tank. Also, it gives me the benefit of um, working on multiple sides of the terrarium at once. If I had everything um, done with spray foam directly onto the glass, I would only be really able to work on one side at a time because if I paint it, then I have to essentially let it dry on that one side um, and then work on the next one. And then if I have another side, I have to work on that one. So essentially it takes a lot longer. Um, however, both methods are totally um, valid. Both methods will lead to very natural looking um, backdrops. And I, I can't say uh, or I can't recommend one more than the other. I just personally find it easier to work on my backdrop outside of the tank and then using some silicone at the very end to glue it in to see the finished look. Um, but that's pretty much my own preference. Uh, I did want to show you both methods and that's what I'm doing in this video. Once again, when you're done carving, it should look something like this. You have gotten rid of most of the shiny parts of the spray foam and you're left with the more rough surface of it. And the reason why we do this is because we're going to apply a liberal amount of silicone and we're going to spread it around. And if you have the shiny parts of the spray foam, the silicone would not adhere to it. Uh, but after the carving, and uh, with having the porous surface, it will actually stick to the spray foam very well. Make sure you're using aquarium safe silicone. You do not have to buy silicone that literally has the label aquarium safe on it. If you go to Home Depot, you will find this aquarium safe silicone as silicone one, and it will have a 100% silicone label on it. Make sure you get that type. And that is also a aquarium safe, but it also only costs half as much as silicone that literally says aquarium safe on it. So you can definitely save some money here. And once you're done applying the silicone, you just use a brush. You can also use your hands, but make sure you're wearing gloves because the stuff is very sticky and you're just going to spread it around and get it into every nook and cranny and crevice. And uh, yeah, this is going to take some time, uh, but you want to make sure that it is on every part of the surface. If you get some on the glass, that's okay. Once it's dry, you can literally use your fingernail or a razor blade to scrape it off the glass. It's not a big deal. And once we've applied the silicone, we're going to put very dry eco earth or cocoa fiber on the surface and the silicone will basically act as the glue. And the benefit of doing a backdrop or sidewall in my case with that method is that the eco earth will later hold moisture very well, which in return keeps the humidity in my tank at, much, at a much higher rate. And that is really, really great for vivariums, especially in my case for the dart frogs because they need a very high humidity and so this will definitely help. However, you can still use this method if you are building a more desert looking like uh, terrarium or vivarium, uh, because if you do not spray directly onto the cocoa fiber on the wall, it will just stay very dry and it will still work and look very natural. And now we're going to apply our eco earth. Again, I'm using eco earth because essentially it's cocoa fiber, but it's already been prepped. So usually if you buy cocoa fiber, you buy it in a very dry block, you add water to it, 
and then it essentially blows up and you get your substrate. However, when you're applying it to your backdrop, you have to make sure that your um, cocoa fiber is very, very dry because if it's wet and you're trying to apply it to the silicone, it will not cure properly. Therefore, the bond between the silicone and the um, cocoa fiber won't be very strong and a lot of it will crumble off later. So for backdrops, if you don't want to wait a couple days for your um, wet cocoa fiber to dry out, I would uh, suggest just buying a bag of Eco Earth. They're less than $10 on average and it gives you about half a bucket full as you can see here on the screen. And that is more than enough for a backdrop project. And like I said, ideally you put silicone everywhere on your backdrop. If you didn't and you will end up with some white spots, uh, you can either come back and add a little bit more silicone once everything has dried and repeat this step. Or in my case, I actually just glued moss over it and uh, that worked for me just as well. Um, you can be very liberal with the amount of cocoa fiber you apply here. Um, but you have to make sure that once you applied it, uh, you can wait for about an hour, I would suggest, and then you turn the tank upside down or upright, whichever way you want to put it, so that the remaining cocoa fiber that's not stuck to the silicone can actually fall off. Therefore, more air gets to it and it can cure properly. Now for the second method of creating a backdrop, we're returning to our styrofoam piece where we're going to use some Drylock Original. You can also use uh, Drylock Extreme. It's even more waterproof, um, but I believe it's a little bit more expensive and Drylock Original will do the job just fine. Uh, it's essentially a color mixed with some very fine sand particles and once everything dries, it, uh, it almost feels like I guess concrete and it's also waterproof. So not only does it have a very natural uh, feeling surface, it also looks very natural if you're coloring it properly. And speaking of coloring, I would highly recommend using concrete coloring, which uh, you, you can usually find in any Home Depot. Uh, the problem for me was that the black coloring was out of stock and uh, not even available to order online. And I didn't want to use any terracotta tones because I didn't want my backdrop to be brown. I wanted it to be uh, gray, so it looks more like rock. And instead of the concrete coloring, I ended up using water-based acrylic coloring. Now, it is, you can use it and it is, um, animal safe just because it's water based and I did some research online and people did say they use this for coloring the dry lock. However, the issue that I ran into is that I needed a lot more of the acrylic color compared to concrete coloring in order to turn it uh, really dark. And then there is also the problem of you watering down the original dry lock too much with the acrylic color, which in my case resulted in longer drying times. So on the instructions, it says it should be dry after about four to eight hours. However, for me, uh, it was still slightly damp even the next day. So that being said, um, I would recommend uh, the concrete coloring instead of the water-based acrylic. Also, no matter how much black I used, there was only a certain shade of gray that I was able to achieve. It just wouldn't turn any darker after that. <laughs> Even if I applied more, it just didn't help. And uh, it wasn't quite as dark as I was hoping for, but I still went with it for that project. Uh, next time I'm definitely going to use the concrete coloring because I personally like a little bit of a darker gray. And then um, I would use a dry brush method with a lighter gray to bring some of the highlights back. Um, but again, for this project, it's fine. And if you don't have the concrete coloring, you don't wanna buy it, but you have a water-based acrylic color um, around, you can definitely use that. Um, and just use a very cheap brush. These are 
about one or two dollar brushes from Home Depot. Um, just before you use it, I recommend really shaking the brush, uh, the bristles, uh, because there's a lot of hairs usually that are loose and that are falling out and they can end up in your backdrop. It's not the end of the world, but once everything dries, you can't easily pull it out and it might take away from the appeal a little bit. And uh, yeah, once you're done mixing, your dry lock with the preferred color. You're just going to spread a liberal amount on the back. Um, you're going to do this either two or three times, depending on how waterproof you want it to be. Um, I, at the end, ended up with two layers on the styrofoam board, and that was totally fine for me. I also found out that um, once I applied the second layer, I brought it outside on a really warm and sunny day and then everything dried within a matter of four hours. So if you can, just bring it outside, put it in the sun and you'll be able to do both, even three layers in one day if you start early enough. So that shouldn't take up too much of your time. Once the dry lock has properly cured, it's time to attach the backdrop to our tank. I suggest doing a dry fit first without the silicone, but once everything fits, just apply a liberal amount on the back and then just pressing it in place where you want it to be. It's usually easier if your tank is laying flat and then you can simply apply some heavier objects on top of it that press down and make sure that everything stays in place. Um, but as you can see, my backdrop has slightly changed. Um, I did add a waterfall feature to my tank and my backdrop was simply too big for the design I had in mind. And speaking of the waterfall, I'm not showing in this video how I build it just because uh, this series would be even longer than it already is. So there will be a separate video of how I do the waterfall. But uh, yeah, essentially I had to cut out a part of the backdrop and I just used a bread knife to do so. Even with the dry log, it was very easy to cut through. Unfortunately, I lost one of the planters that I installed in the process, but again, I installed a waterfall instead and it was a fair trade-off to me. So the planter is gone. Um, and I also left the two inch space that I mentioned in the first part of the video. And that is because we're going to spray down some of the spray foam. We're going to put the PVC pipe, which I've cut into the proper size. Um, and I'm using this pipe to run my cable through. So in the event that I ever need to replace the water filter that is inside of my waterfall, I can easily do so. Um, you can technically spray paint the cable into place uh, or a water filter into place right away, but you would never be able to really change it should you run into any issues and then you would have to remove the entire piece or live without the water feature. So I just wanted everything to be easy and accessible and that's why I decided to do it this way. Um, and essentially we're just repeating all the steps that we have done previously. We're using the spray foam to um, cover the PVC pipe and also to connect the uh, backdrop to the sidewall. We're letting everything dry and then we're going to carve the spray foam again, uh, getting rid of all the shiny parts. We're going to apply silicone on top of that and then we're pressing down Eco Earth and therefore we are creating one coherent backdrop sidewall piece and it will all look very natural.
And once the backdrop has properly cured once again, we're going to put in our false bottom. Again, for this part, you can ignore the fact that I have a waterfall installed. If you do not have one, it's totally fine. It works exactly the same way now. We're going to put down some of the silicone and then we're putting in our false bottom, pressing it down, putting some weights on top of it and uh, letting it cure overnight. Now, I would give one piece of advice and that is to make your false bottom a little bit smaller uh, than the inside dimensions. Don't try to make it a snug fit inside. Uh, the problem that I ran into is that I really followed the exact inside dimensions of the tank and I did not account for three little plastic brackets uh, in the front part of the Exoterra tank uh, where you can see that black ventilating strip. There are three little plastic notches and they stand out about half an inch. So when I tried to put in my false bottom, it got caught on those plastic, on two of the three plastic brackets. And it was a real pain to uh, get everything inside without breaking the tank, breaking the front panel. Um, and it was a very delicate process that took quite some time. Um, and I'll speed up the video so you'll see how long exactly it took me uh, to do it. But essentially what I ended up doing is uh, I used scissors to cut um, some of the plastic edges out of the false bottom so I could navigate it around the uh, plastic brackets. Um, so like I said, try to make it maybe an overall an inch less or at least half an inch less than the uh, inside measurements. And if you end up with any gaps where you're worried that um, some soil might fall into the water, you can fill these gaps with some aquarium gravel um, so that the uh, soil just sits on top of the gravel and that totally works. With the false bottom installed, it is now time for my vivarium to travel to its final destination, which is my office. As you can see, I've also added some moss to my backdrop. If you want to do the same and create an even more realistic environment, you can just buy some sheet moss at your local reptile store or online. Even Michaels is selling dried moss and uh, you can use the aquarium safe silicone and just literally glue it to the backdrop and it usually grows back very well if you keep it moist. Sometimes it doesn't and then after a couple months you have to replace it, uh, but it's usually not a big deal. Um, and really at this point, the decorating part, it comes down to what you like and what look you're going for. In my case, I was trying to create a forest uh, running down to a pond kind of look. Um, but again, you can make anything that you want at this point. Um, for the substrate, I would recommend going for a cocoa fiber mix uh, together with some sphagnum moss to keep the moisture very high and very well. You can also add some carbon, which essentially is just charcoal. However, if you use that, uh, make sure you use charcoal that's very organic where there's no um, burning additives added uh, because that is very toxic toxic to pretty much uh, the entire environment where your animals live in. But uh, some regular carbon or charcoal will actually help fight some of the mold that might grow. Um, and that's a mold is a natural thing occurring, but the carbon will help keeping it down. And also the springtails, which I highly recommend that you add, uh, will use the carbon or charcoal to uh, lay eggs and you know, grow even more springtails, which is something that you want. 
even though it might not sound like something you want, but it's definitely something you do. Um, you should also add some isopods because the springtails and the isopods, um, they will first of all feast on the mold. Um, and again, mold is a natural occurring, uh, but you want to keep it in check and uh, these uh, insects will definitely help. And uh, also the isopods and the springtails will clean up after your animals. So depending on what type of animals you're having, uh, you might never have to spot clean or uh, clean up any poop uh, that your animals dropped. So in my case, because I have frogs and they poop very little, um, I will virtually never have to go in and clean up their poop unless it gets out of hand. Uh, but obviously if you have something like an iguana, um, isopods and springtails won't help. So you will definitely still have to spot clean in that case. But overall you want uh, your substrate to be healthy. Uh, and I would also recommend adding some crushed up leaf litter um, into your mix because the isopods will uh, use that as food aside from the waste because they can just live off of poop alone. So they will need some leaf litter and um, overall you can add uh, just general leaves bigger leaves on top of the soil as well uh, that's very common uh, to see that in a vivarium but again i'm going to speed up this process because it's just me decorating at this point and uh, again your tank will look different from mine i'm sure and uh, yeah but i hope you enjoyed i hope this was informative and helpful to you and if you have any questions now that the series has uh, conclude it uh, just put it in the comments and I will do my best to answer again uh, pretty much all of the materials that I used will be in the description and yeah I hope I see you in my next building video